Perfect. Now we are live on the YouTube. Perfect. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And you are most welcome to the second session of the 2022 Glaucoma series of the Sinjab Academy Glaucoma Club. Um, in this session, we will have our distinguished speaker and old friend, Dr. Munir Atri. And uh, actually, Dr. Munir has a very nice way of presentation. I like his way of presentation um, because it is systematic. It takes us uh, step by step and uh, it is comprehensive at the same time, so doesn't miss any information. And at the same time, it is practical. So it correlates the basic with the clinical practice and surgical uh, techniques. Uh, this is why it is very distinguished uh, session. And uh, really I appreciate and thank Dr. Munir for accepting the invitation and for his great efforts to uh, establish the glaucoma series, the 2021 one and the 2022 one as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Munir Atri. And you are um, very well known to everybody and you, you don't need to be introduced actually. The stage is yours, Dr. Munir. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mazin. It's, it's always a pleasure to be with you. It's always a pleasure and to be with all the other colleagues, actually. And uh, thank you very much. So today, uh, the topic is um, about the ocular surface um, uh, disease and the glaucoma surgery. Uh, I tried just to make it um, as practical as possible. It's a tricky uh, topic because there are no um, literature, no enough literature about this topic. However, I tried to collect the most, let's say, um, um, important study, um, mostly RCT study in addition to other studies, to be able to give some clues about what we need to do in such cases. I will be concentrating mainly on the trabeculectomy surgery as a glaucoma um, uh, surgery. So, uh, the, so the, the main topic which I'm going to cover today Introduction, the negative effect of the anti-glaucoma drops on the ocular surface, the effects of the glaucoma surgery on ocular surface, which we are going to see it can be positive or even negative, and then optimizing the ocular surface before the glaucoma surgery. And lastly, I'll just give a real life example, and then possibly together we can try to um, um, comment on this. So to start with, um, I just wanted to show you this slide, uh, which um, is a slide from a great work from uh, David Broadway. It's uh, major studies or review in the past, actually. And he showed very clearly that the ocular service effect of medical uh, therapy, mainly the uh, preservative in the, in the eye drops we mean, it can cause damage on four levels in the eye, not only on the ocular surface. It can cause lens toxicity, which can lead to cataract and in turn can lead to loss of vision or reduced vision. It can lead to corneal cell toxicity and conjunctival cell toxicity. And the corneal cell toxicity, meaning reduced uh, compliance and reduced using the drops, which may mainly affect the uh, drop efficacy and then cause to obviously stop the drops at some stage. And at the sa same thing, it can increase the pressure. The same with conch cell toxicity. Conch cell toxicity, it can cause ocular surface disease, but at the same time, which is extremely important, it can reduce the surgical success rate as we are going to see because of the scarring which may happen. And lastly, which is extremely important in the glaucoma, it can only it can um, also affect the trabecular, trabecular meshwork, which can lead to high pressure in addition to possibly less laser efficacy. We are talking about ALT and the SLT, 
because if you have um, a meshwork, trabecular meshwork full of um, cytokines and other inflammatory markers, it will not behave in the same way as the normal trabecular meshwork. And a lot of studies they showed if you stop the preservative in the drops, that's in itself, it can uh, decrease the pressure uh, in addition to treating the ocular surface, obviously. And that's, so again, if we call this, uh, if you go to the ocular, the IOP control will be less, again, in the same um, 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 category, which will affect the visual field. So all of these can cause reduced vision, reduced visual field, and at the end of the day, it can reduce quality of life of the patient. So, what is the ocular surface disease related to glaucoma? By definition, it is imbalance of the ocular surface hemostasis caused by the toxic effect of chronic topical medication, which can lead to uh, three way of damage. Tear film can be affected, epithelial damage, conge and cornea, and inflammation. And if we forget about the lens and the meshwork for the time being, if we are only going to talk about the ocular surface, so we have to think about it on four levels. The tear film, which can be affected, the eyelids, like blepharitis, myelomic gland dysfunction, the conch, and the cornea. So these are the, the main components or let's say structure of the eye, which you need to concentrate on when you examine any patient uh, who you are suspecting ocular surface disease uh, in their eyes. So, why ocular surface disease is extremely important in glaucoma? Because it can affect the quality of life, as we showed. It can affect the visual acuity. And if we have ocular surface disease, we need to treat. So there will be the extra cost of the treating the ocular surface disease. The most important one is the adherence to the treatment. So the patient will tell you they are using the drugs, but in fact, they will not be using the drugs and that can cause progression of the disease. So the patient would come to you, you check the pressure, pressure is fine, but in between the visits, they will not be using the drops on a regular basis because they have ocular surface disease. So that can cause progression. And obviously, which is extremely important as well, the failure of the glaucoma surgery, mainly the trabeclectomy I'm talking about here. So any previous use of preservative or um, toxic, uh, powerful eye drops can cause failure of the glaucoma surgery because of the scarring. And lastly, severe blepharitis, especially if this turned into bacterial blepharitis, it can cause post-operative endophthalmitis. So that's again, uh, one more thing to think about whenever we see patients with ocular surface disease who we are trying to assess for either glaucoma treatment or glaucoma surgery. The mechanism of the ocular surface disease, forget about this graph, just concentrate on these four categories. So it's always the tear film instability, which can cause my bone gland dysfunction and vice versa. So that can be the first uh, um, uh, structure will be affected with any preservative. That can cause hyperosmolarity of the tears, which can cause apoptosis of the cells, in turn cause inflammation, and then again, go back to the tear film, passing the goblet cell loss. Please concentrate on this because this is extremely important uh, for any um, uh, surgical intervention. So as you are going to see, that's the key sometimes in getting good outcome after trabeculectomy surgery. So this is the vicious cycle actually. And for each pathway, there is treatment as we are going to see as well. Anyway. So to start with assessing the ocular surface disease, before assessing the signs, we need to assess the symptoms. And patients, patients who we see in our clinic who are, have been using the glaucoma drops, there are two types of patients usually. Patients who complain about a lot of things like irritation, dryness, redness, all sorts of things. And those patients are common, very common. However, there is another type of patient who are the asymptomatic patient. And those are the patients who um, um, do, do not um, uh, complain about anything. And that could be because of two reasons. The first reason, it could be subjective. So patient, they have the ocular surface symptoms, but they have 
a high threshold for pain or irritation or uh, grittiness, they won't mention about this. But the other reason, which I found it's really kind in the literature is it's uh, not all of the papers mentioned about it, but a lot of papers uh, started obviously mentioning about it recently. It's just the, the effect of the uh, uh, preservative, mainly uh, benzalkanium, uh, benzalkanium chloride, uh, BKA. So that can cause numbing effect of the ocular surface disease because it affects the, the nerves in the cornea, the subbasal nerve. So a lot of patients who may come to you and you see their eyes extremely red, they have all sorts of uh, uh, punctate epitheliopathy, all sorts of reaction in their conge, but they are not really complaining. And that could be because they have been using the drugs for many, many years. So the uh, BAK affected their nerves and they have almost kind of neurotrophic uh, cornea, so they don't feel the pain anymore. So that's something very important to, to understand. So those patients, even if they don't complain, we need to treat and we need to think about that because otherwise they will end up with a, a lot of problem in the future and including, you know, stem cell deficiency, dry eye, ulceration, uh, all sorts of things. So what signs we need to look at in any patient with ocular cervical disease? As I mentioned, four, four categories we need to think about. Tear film, uh, margins of the eyelids, uh, conge, and cornea. So if we start with the margins of the eyelid, we need to look at the blepharitis, my bone gland dysfunction. It's well known to everyone. Um, the tear film, you need to look at for, for the um, uh, Schirmer test or B, uh, break up tear film time, uh, in addition to uh, punctate epitheliopathy. Uh, the cornea, you need to look for the uh, mucus, uh, punctate epitheliopathy, um, uh, keratitis uh, related to, uh, to this. Conch, you need to look for the reaction, whether this is follicular, papillary, in addition to the redness. And uh, finally, the limbus, uh, limbal stem cell, because a lot of these cell uh, drops can cause limbal stem cell deficiency after many, many years of using it. So these are the signs which you need to look at, not only the redness, um, because each one of these signs, it can tell you a lot. And it's very important to consider the proper treatment. So for example, patients who have dry eye only without any other signs, you can treat with the drops, which can just, just to replicate the eye. But if you have significant reaction from the conge, blepharitis, so you need to treat these as well. So you need to know what you are treating before you start the treatment. Um, there is a very nice study. Uh, it's the up-down uh, sign of acute ocular surface drug toxicity. And that's when you ask the patient to look up and you see a lot of redness and sometimes a staining here and look down and you see the difference between up and down. So that's again, another way of checking things for the toxicity. However, this is possibly not very applicable in uh, glaucoma eye drops because that's meant, uh, this sign is very useful in a patient who are using the uh, drops on very frequent basis, mainly for the corneal ulcer, like if they are using drops on regular basis every hour or so, but it's less obviously less significant in patients who are on glaucoma eye drops, but it's uh, something else to check, uh, to look at. Now, talking about the anti-glaucoma eye drops and the ocular surface disease, in the glaucoma eye drops, why do why patients develop the ocular surface disease? Because of two reasons, the preservative inside the drop or the active ingredient itself. The preservative, we have many types, but the most common one, which I'm going to talk about mainly, is the uh, BAK. That's the most common one because the other ones like Purate, uh, Sophia, those kind of things, they are not very uh, well known because they are costly and they are not as effective in, uh, as BAK. The other reason, as we said, is the active ingredients. And here on top of the list, pilocarpine, brimonidine, iopidine, and bimetoprost. These four eye drops, uh, they are really, really, uh, they can cause a lot of inflammation in the eye. And, even without preservative, they can cause a lot of um, release of the cytokines and uh, some scarring tissue. So that's something else to consider actually, not only the preservative itself. Talking about the preservative, BAK, 
It's good, yes, because it works in a mechanism where it damages the bacterial walls and membrane. And that's why it can be very effective antimicrobial preservative inside the bottle. And that's why it's very common and uh, it's cheap, much cheaper than others. The other benefit of the BAK, it can penetrate the ocular surface because it can penetrate the cornea and uh, improve the uh, penetration of the drops inside the AC. And that's why it's preferred compared with others. However, the bad thing about it, it is toxic to human cells, including the trabecular web meshwork cells, as we mentioned before. And that's in itself, it can cause increase in the pressure. And in some people, they say it can affect the results of the SLT or ALT. The other reason, it can cause ocular surface inflammation, which can interact with the lipid component of the tear film that cause more uh, dry eye and more inflammation in the eye. Now, there are high risk groups to develop ocular surface disease in any glaucoma patient. So whenever we start patient on preserve the drops, think about these groups. And if you think your patient is one of those, if you have any other option like preservative free drops, SLT, so possibly it's better to consider this. The first group on top of the list, any patient with a stem cell deficiency, either partial or 360 degree. This is a big no-no to give uh, any page, any um, drops with BAK. Second category, allergic to preservative, severe dry eye, atopic dermatitis, blepharitis, or myeloma gland disease. Obviously, we are talking about severe uh, disease. Third category, children and young patients, because they will be using the BAK for a long time, so they will be having problem in, at some stage of their life, and this problem can be very significant. And then there is the, the this one is interesting. So if your patient is expected to have surgical uh, procedure, and if you give BAK, so the surgical procedure itself, especially if they have been using the BAK for a long time, it can cause decompensation of the ocular surface. And that's obviously well known um, according to the literature. So that's an, again, another thing. So in fact, most of the glaucoma patients, they may need surgical intervention. So that's why I would say possibly in most patients, it's not a good idea to give a drops with BAK if possible. Last category is any patient with diabetes, or previous uh, LASIK or uh, refractive laser refractive surgery. So that's from the eyes point of view. There is another group depending on this type of the, of the glaucoma. So any moderate to severe ocular surface disease was found mainly in the severe glaucoma and it was related to how high is the pressure. So in other words, if you have a patient with a pressure of 30 plus uncontrolled um, uh, IOP and you are giving the maximum medical treatment, so this combination, it can be very toxic to the ocular surface. It's not as toxic if your patient has mild glaucoma with controlled IOP. So if you have high IOP and you are giving BAK, again, you are increasing the trouble. So the exfoliation glaucoma is the other category. And the, the reason, the exact reason is unknown. However, some um, uh, studies, they showed that possibly is the uh, soda exfoliative material, which are uh, 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 stuck to the uh, uh, endothelium or to the uh, trabecular meshwork can um, participate. Primary angle closure glaucoma, again, because the narrow angle and uh, the previous high pressure so that can affect the pumps in the endothelium. And lastly, the new vascular glaucoma, especially in diabetic patients. So these are the categories from the glaucoma type of a point of view to consider whenever you are giving patient with the drops with BAK for a long time. So those really usually develop the worst um, uh, ocular surface disease. How common? It is quite common and the literature is estimating roughly about 42 patients uh, who are using the drops for the glaucoma to have ocular surface disease, and it is severe in about a third of the patient. So if you can imagine, third of your patient, they have severe ocular surface disease, which can affect their quality of life, which can affect their compliance with the drops. They are not using the drops properly, 
and it can definitely affect the results of your um, uh, surgery. The, again, the evidence is showing that the ocular surface disease can increase the greater the number of glaucoma drugs prescribed. So if you are using, for example, latanoprost once a day in the evening, even if this is preserved, you expect much less uh, ocular surface disease compared with, for example, dorzolamide preserved three times a day because you are using the BAK three times a day, but you are using the latanoprost with the BAK once a day. And uh, each additional BAK eye drop was associated with approximately two times higher odds of showing dry eye changes. So the more you add uh, eye drops, the, uh, the worse the, uh, the ocular surface disease. And that's why always think about, if possible, combining your agent in one drop to use once a day, rather than using two agent. Uh, I'm talking about preserved drops because the more you add, the more you cause problem. Switching from preserved to preservative-free eye drops can improve the IOP, and that's a, that's a fact. So not only the ocular surface, it can reduce the the it can it can reduce the need for the lubricants and it can improve the ocular surface, but it can definitely improve the IOP control. So. Sometimes you find that your patient is not controlled, let's say with the preserved combination and you change to preservative combination and you see the pressure two or three millimeter less. And that's because the inflammation inside the eye, the inflammation inside the trabeculum could be less. So that's something again else to think about. This is interesting study actually. <laughs> they, they were really, I don't know, very smart study. They used electronic monitoring device and they gave it to the patient and they distributed the, this between 200 patients. Um, and then uh, this electronic device was just giving kind of um, a signal uh, to the central system um, in the uh, research uh, office to say, when is the patient using the drugs? And they then kind of compared what the patient were reporting to um, the actual use of the drops, um, provided obviously knowing that all the patients, they knew already that someone is observing their performance. And they found that patient reported, despite the fact that they were known, that they were aware that someone is observing their performance. So they reported higher medication use than their actual behavior. And the patient reported, as a mean standard or mean, sorry, use, almost all of them, they said they were using the drugs. The physician guessed only 0.7 that, and the other, they were not using the drugs, but in fact, what was calculated with the electronic device was less than that. So the point is, again, if the patient is saying they are using the drugs, they may not be using the drug because they have a lot of problem because of that. And the literature, the agreed number, poor complex was found in more than one third of the patient with the glaucoma. So if you can imagine one third of your patient coming to your clinic uh, using the drops, they will tell you they are using the drops and okay, fair enough. They may be using it on and off, but not all the time. And that's why possibly, despite having very nice pressure in the clinic, you will see further deterioration in the field. So here you need to, think about solution to try to improve the quality of life of the patient to convince them to use the drugs. The, if we are talking about the ingredients, active ingredients, um, again, this is another very nice study. They showed that if you use preserved prostaglandin, um, it can cause a lot of uh, inflammation uh, and increasing the inflammatory markers, cytokines, ocular surface uh, disease compared to uh, uh, preservative-free uh, prostaglandin. So in other words, if you have latanoprost, which is preserved, and if you have latanoprost preservative-free, so the difference is significant in terms of the ocular surface disease. So if you can always switch from latanoprost to latanoprost preservative-free is always better. However, no such difference was observed in the beta blocker. So it's always better if you have access to preservative free beta blocker, but if you don't have access to preservative free beta blocker, 
you can still use it um, um, because it's not as bad as the preserved uh, prostaglandin. The other thing is the pilocarpine antimolol in itself, it has obviously significant uh, effect on the human myeloma gland epithelial cells, which can affect the tears and it can affect the uh, stability of the uh, tears and dry, cause dry eye. Brimonidine as well, it has the same issue and not only on the uh, myeloma gland dysfunction, on the actual uh, corneal and epithelial cells as well. So we know that it's not only the preservative we need to accuse, it's just the, act the active ingredient itself, especially the um, uh, uh, alpha agonist, alpha two agonist, especially the pilocarpine, uh, especially the, um, um, the uh, uh, latanoprost uh, eye drop or the prostaglandin eye drops. The effect of the prostaglandin analog on the outcome of the trabeculectomy, again, this is another um, interesting study. So they tried to compare, they took a large number of patients and they tried to compare the metoprost, latanoprost, tafloprost, and shravoprost on the outcome of the trabeculectomy. And what they found, and I completely agree with that, is the metoprost was associated with much higher risk of failed trabeculectomy up to two years post-surgery. So in other words, lumigan or bimetoprost is the most toxic eye drop to, to the ocular surface out of this prostaglandin. That's why personally, I always try to avoid it. And what they found as well, which is again, very interesting, the metoprost itself can cause deepening of the upper sulcus as a long-term effect. So if you see this sign, the deepening of the upper eyelid sulcus, in addition to uh, previous use of metoprost, so the risk of failure of the trap is significantly higher because whenever you have these two, the mechanism will be scarring and mechanical, not only uh, scarring. So these two are kind of warning sign for you. And in these cases, I personally now started to switch towards a more posterior uh, bleb. So possibly preserve flow or even tube surgery rather than trabeculectomy if I see these signs. Um, glaucoma surgery and ocular surface disease. So again, I like these things because it tells you a lot. Um, the, after trabeculectomy, there are three phases of healing for the trap door or for the blip. The inflammatory phase, the granulation phase, and the scarring phase. Yes, Dr. Mazen, any question? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, Munir uh, first, I would like to thank you very much for the very nice information. Actually, um, you made us aware of the effect of the ingredient, ingredient itself, not only the preservative. Now, um, my question is, um, it is well known that the patient who is using anti-glaucoma medications, uh, it's a must to use lubricants um, because we know that of the irritation of the ocular surface. So uh, do the lubricants uh, reduce the effect of uh, the, the side effect of the ing ingredients uh, very similar to what they do for the uh, preservatives? Yes, uh, now the trouble is it depends on the type of the lubricants. If you are using lubricants which contains BAK, so in fact, okay, you are giving the patient some um, comfort, but you are increasing the trouble long-term because you are increasing the number of the BAK in the eye. The trouble, it depends on the country. Like here, for example, they always uh, offer the patient the preservative-free option, even as a glaucoma patient. So if I'm putting my patient on latanoprof preservative-free, which is called monopost here, I don't usually uh, prescribe lubricants at all because there is no need. Most patients, they will come with a white eye after years of using it. But if you are using page, uh, drops with the preservative, I think if you have access to preservative-free lubricants, yes, definitely. Uh, if not, it's a tricky situation, but we have to go with what we have. So yes, you can prescribe, but not very frequently, possibly. Now, um, let's say maybe this is related to the... Uh climate, weather, environment, because 
here, um, let's say in, in hot areas or hot countries, um, even if we use the preservative free, uh, you will find the patients are suffering from the red eyes, okay? Uh, because we have such products here, preservative-free uh, prostaglandins, and they, they suffer from red eyes and from irritation. This is why we give them the lubricants. So uh, this is one point. And uh, sometimes I find it related to the, uh, the, let's say, skin color. So dark skin people are more sensitive to white skin people. Did you find uh, something similar th to this in the UK or? No? Yes, yes. Most Afro-Caribbean, as you said, uh, they always, most of the time, they have really kind of bad reaction to the glaucoma drops, whichever type you give. But it's always, you try to give the most gentler type if possible. But yes, I noticed this. Afro-Caribbean patients, especially Asian patients, they develop more redness compared with Caucasian. That's very true. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. So yeah, talking about the healing process, uh, the reason why I put this actually, just to show you that we have three phases of healing after the trabeculectomy, the inflammatory, the granulation, and the scarring. Inflammatory process, uh, phase is usually the early phase. So almost between two to uh, four weeks after the surgery. Uh, most, most likely two weeks only, but sometimes it can be expanded. And that's where the cytokines and the, the, the inflammatory uh, cells, including the uh, lymphocytes and neutrophil, that they can accumulate. So if you have patient with already very inflamed eye, very inflamed conch because of the uh, uh, preservative or because of the active ingredients, and if you operate on them, so during the inflammatory uh, phase, you have army of these cells and it's extremely difficult. Even if you use uh, mitomycin up to 0 0.9, which very rarely, very rarely people that are using it now, you, can, you cannot get rid of this. So that's very important. So you need to try to reduce this army of the inflammatory cells before you do the surgery. So at least you can deal with your inflammatory phase in a reasonable way and move to the granulation phase, which can happen almost about four to six weeks after the surgery. And then hopefully if that's, these two phases are kind of um, uh, done properly, the scarring will be nice and you will get very good outcome. And here, I just want to uh, mention that during the inflammatory phase, steroids can be the key. When you move to the granulation phase, it's a mix of the, uh, uh, the steroids and the uh, antifibrotic including five of you, the scarring phase, there is nothing will work. So it will fail anyway. So if you have scarring, that's it. So how ocular surface disease impact the glaucoma surgery? As we said, it's mostly the BAK toxicity in addition to the active ingredients. And here, the reason why I, in the first slide, I told you about the goblet cells. So they found that BAK can cause inflammation and loss of goblet cells in the conch. And in this study, which is again, very nice study, they were trying to predict the outcome of the trabeculectomy surgery. How can we uh, predict whether this trap is gonna work or this trap is not gonna work? So they took large sample, almost 60 patients uh, having trabeculectomy and they did confocal microscopy and impression cytology um, uh, before the surgery and 12 months after the surgery. And they tried to see what's happening with the goblet cells. So they divided into three groups. This is the first group. The first group, it was complete success. So here, as you can see, a lot of goblet cells were there in the in vivo confocal microscopy. And these goblet cells will not affected uh, because of previous use of uh, BAK, because patients were mostly using uh, the drops for a short time or even preservative free and they mostly have complete success after proper treatment. Um, the other group, they showed some goblet cells. They have something called qualified success. So the bleb was partially functioning, but the patient needed drops to be able to control the pressure after the, 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 the surgery. And this is the third group. 
third group, if you compare the goblet cells here with the goblet cells there, they almost before the surgery had no goblet cells at all. And patients with no goblet cells in the conch, they ended up with complete failure. So that's really very nice way in predicting whether your patient is gonna uh, respond or not. Uh, not all the centers, they have it. Um, and the other thing is this is reversible. And that's why I'm saying you have to treat your patient and optimize the ocular surface. So if you have a patient with no goblet cells because of the inflammation, you can restore the function of the, of the, of the goblet cells by doing the proper treatment or giving the proper treatment as I'm going to show you uh, very soon. Predicting the outcome, again, another study to predict the outcome. And this uh, study, uh, the sample was double almost, almost 130 patients. And they found two interesting things actually. Um, they found that the actual time for, to, from, sur uh, to, from surgery to the failure in patient receiving higher preoperative uh, pre daily doses of BAK was shorter than patient who had less BAK exposure. So in other words, the dose or the frequency of the drops was more important. So if you have a patient who is using four, three agents on very frequent basis for the glaucoma, those patients are much more at much more risk of having a quick failure compared with the patient who is using only one or two agents, for example, only twice a day. And the other thing which they found interesting in this uh, nice study, they found that the period of the treatment is more significant than the number of different agents. So if you have a patient who is using two agents for 20 years, so they will be at higher risk of failure compared with patient who has been using three lots of drops for one year, for example, because the, the actual time for these changes in the ocular service, it takes years and years. And sometimes one or two years may not be enough to, to, to cause this inflammatory um, uh, changes. The, any glaucoma or any trabeculectomy surgery uh, has two effects on the ocular surface. It can be positive or uh, negative. So talking about the positive effect, this is again another study which is showing before and after. So here, after obviously six months of the surgery, this is before the surgery, this is six months after the surgery, you can see the restoration of the goblet cells is started to improve after the surgery. They had few, but they had more after the surgery. The subbasal nerves, they were very um, irregular. They became much more regular. And the dendritic cells as well, uh, here, in addition to the myobomian gland irregularity and inflammation improved after the surgery. So we have evidence to say that the surgery can help in restoring the, the normality of the ocular service, which we all know about. And I wasn't really surprised with, with these uh, studies. Uh, and this is the same study. It's just showing that the actual myobomian gland dysfunction became less after the surgery. So this is the blue one is after the surgery and the brown one is before the surgery. So my bone gland dysfunction uh, uh, or the inflammation became less, the dendritic cells activation became less, and all the other uh, uh, things, including the uh, inflammatory uh, marker became less. But what I found interesting here, so despite the fact that the ocular service uh, 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 scoring became better, but the actual visual function quality it's reduced. So I know that you see the numbers here, both of them are less, but that's, take my word on it. So less OSD, it means better surface, uh, ocular surface. So that's fine. That's, uh, you know, fits with the surgery results. But what I found interesting that most patients, despite having the surgery, I was expecting patient to have better quality of life. And it wasn't the case. And they found that the reason is the trouble which can happen after the surgery and the ocular surface disease which can happen after the surgery. So if you think the surgery will end up your problem, unfortunately think again, because it's not always the case. So this is a big study, 400 patients, worsening of the ocular surface disease post glaucoma surgery. So they tried to investigate and see what's happening. And they found that 
corneal epithelial defects were found in about 11%, filamentary keratitis in 3%, delen in 2%, which needed surgical intervention. The significant risk for those patients who develop this was the superficial punctate keratopathy before the surgery or history of diabetes. So these two categories, in other words, if you have very severe dry eye before the surgery or diabetic uh, patient, these two categories, they are more prone to have problem after the surgery. And the other reasons of the trouble after the surgery is the dry eye, and that could be multifactorial, can be related to the drops which the patient has been using after the treatment, after the surgery, or because of the previous treatment or the uh, myobomine gland dysfunction. Allergic reaction, again, another problem because of the long course of treatment you give after the uh, surgery. Diesthesia, this is, this is the main problem, I think. And uh, from my experience, a lot of people, that could be their problem because the blib itself, especially if this is elevated blib, not shallow and diffuse, and especially if this is superior nasal, patient won't like it. And they will most of the time at least mention it to you. And only they be very frank about it when you ask about the, this in detail, especially if their glaucoma surgery is working nicely. So they don't want to mention it to you. The limbal stem cell deficiency, again, this is another thing. So any patient with limbal stem cell deficiency, you need to be very careful because of the 5-FU or mitomycin. And if you need to apply it, you need to protect the cornea. And after this, in the, in the clinic, if you are giving five of you injections in the clinic itself, in any patient with limbal stem cell deficiency, this is a, something you need to be very careful with because five of you is very toxic. And even if you don't see the five of you kind of covering the cornea for no, not leaking or anything, you need to wash the eye very carefully after the, injecting the patient in the clinic because it can increase the problem, especially if this is sectoral, it can become sometimes more and more. Delen, as we mentioned, and that's blib related or loose sutures. So these are the things which to look at after the surgery, which can cause a lot of trouble to the patient and patient will still not be happy with their ocular surface disease after the surgery. So this is the, for example, sectoral limbal stem cell deficiency. As you can tell here, you have abnormal conjunctival epithelium invading the corneal epithelium, taking abnormal stain. And those kind of patients, you have to be very careful with them, especially if you deal with mitomycin or 5-FU. Otherwise, you will end up with this uh, 360 degrees. This is the, the type of blib which can cause trouble, elevated localized cystic blib under the upper lid, especially upper nasal. This is upper temporal, but I'm talking Obviously, generally speaking, upper nasal is the worst. And delen, so if you have blib, which is very close to the uh, functioning blib, very close to the uh, uh, limbus, you have to be careful and always check for delen. And that's why the Morfield Safer Surgical Technique, it aimed to have posterior flow rather than flow at the limbus. So in other words, uh, the, the actual trap it has to be flow, um, draining posteriorly. And that's why not coming to the limbus when you do the scleral flap and then making this much longer than this. So you will be having the posterior flow and that's will get rid of this in most cases, obviously. So rather than having uh, a flow from the sides, you will have flow just posteriorly. Last flu, flu, few slides and hopefully we can share it together. So the management of the ocular surface disease, I showed this before, how can we manage it? So for each category, we have to treat this specific phase. So for the tear films instability and the myobomic gland dysfunction, we know what we need to do. We need to start using the patient, uh, start the patient on lubricating drops, something with the possibly lipid um, um, component to help with the lipid layer. Um, we need to uh, treat the apoptosis by uh, either, if this is very severe, autologous serum, omega-3. Uh, once we reach to the inflammatory process, we need to deal with it with the steroids, cyclosporine, doxycycline, 
in addition to the mechanical lid hygiene and all those sort of things. I think we all know about it, so I don't want to go into details about this. A couple of more studies, again. Uh, this is another study which uh, was trying to see whether anything we do before the surgery can increase the chances of having better success. And they uh, recruited large number of patients. Uh, and then they uh, divided the patient into three groups, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drops, steroidal anti-inflammatory drops, and placebo. And they found that topical non-steroidal and steroids for one month before the surgery was associated with improved trabeculectomy outcome um, uh, in terms of likelihood of post-operative needling. So in general, both together, they were showing good results in avoiding the needling. However, the steroid group before the surgery, they were um, um, uh, showing less IOP compared with all the other groups. So in other words, steroids before the surgery in inflamed ocular surface is proved to have better outcome long-term. How do we manage the ocular surface disease? So first of all, uh, according to the LIGHT study now, the first line of treatment, if you have a patient with early glaucoma or ocular hypertension is SLT. So try to avoid the, uh, the, the, the drops if possible. However, if you have to use the drops, fine, you can use the drops, but try to use preservative-free drops if you have access to. If you don't have access to, try to use as much, uh, sorry, as less as possible agents. So if you are going to use one agent, use latanoprost. If you are going to use two agent, for example, use xalacom or combination of latanoprost and timolol, rather than using two lots of eye drops or three lots, because the more you add, you are adding more toxicity and you are adding more BAK to the surface of the eye. My approach nowadays, depending on the type of the mix, I can always suggest mix to try to postpone the filtering surgery if I have inflamed eye. I don't prefer to, or not only I don't prefer, I don't take any patient to the theater with inflamed eye to do trabeculectomy because I know it will fail. Uh, so always consider this as an option if possible, like eye stand or nowadays million options like you know with the GAT or Omni or other options you can try or hydris. Um, if you can stop all the drops and the patient has no contraindication, my, my best approach usually is to give the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors uh, as a systemic like Diamox uh, for at least four to six weeks before the surgery. And that can make a big difference in reducing the cytokines, the inflammatory markers and the neutrophil and the lymphocytes. Um, I always consider preservative-free bioprotective drops, including sodium hyaluronate, in addition to uh, uh, trialose. If you have access to, treat the myobomic gland dysfunction, uh, lead hygiene, expression of myobomic gland, anti-inflammatory, as we said, topical preservative-free steroids, cyclosporine, if you'd like to, but keep in mind cyclosporine will take time to work. It will take six weeks to work. So if you are using cyclosporine, you have to give it at least three to six months before the surgery. Systemic doxycycline, always, always uh, helpful in these cases. Um, and uh, omega-3 or anything similar, at least six weeks before the surgery, because it won't really you won't be able to achieve your target before at least six weeks uh, uh, of doing this. So this is the, the case, which I just wanted to show. This is real life case. The photo is from the internet, so ignore the photo, but the actual scenario is real. So this was a patient who attended my clinic a year ago, Afro-Caribbean PhD student uh, patient, 42 years old, um, attended with the, unfortunately, uh, presenting IOP was extremely, extremely high when the uh, optician saw him and referred him. He already lost one eye completely, uh, cup desk ratio almost 10 out of 10. The other eye came with the uh, very high pressure as well, cup desk ratio 0.9. Uh, he was uh, using the Matoprost and Timolol as a combination. We call it Gamfort here and uh, brimonidine. He has been using this for two years in Nigeria before coming uh, to the UK. He had previously had SLT, which didn't work. IOP in this only eye was 30. 
with the very advanced country visual field progression. And uh, cup disc ratio is 0 0.9. Take my words on the Humphrey visual field, it was completely, almost only tiny island of vision left. So what would you do in this case? Obviously the eye extremely red, very, very red. And uh, you have no time because in other words, this patient has been on maximum agent. Sorry, I forgot to mention, he was on Diamox as well here. So I didn't mention this. He was on low dose of Diamox and 30 milligram, uh, 30 millimeter mercury. Uh, so to cut the story short, I started him on low dose of Diamox, kept him on low dose of Diamox actually for six to eight weeks because I knew my options were limited. Uh, if I'm going to take him to the theater with the eyes like, you know, um, raspberry or strawberry, it will fail. He's young and Afro-Caribbean, so all the risks are there. So I just tried to uh, um, start him or keep him on low dose Diamox, stopped his brimonidine and bimetoprost eye drop because as I told you, I don't like these two agents. They are extremely toxic. Started him on my preferred combination, which is preservative-free timolol dorzolamide, which is the COSOPT, preservative-free, and preservative-free latanoprost, which we call it monopost here. Um, hydrocortisone or prednisolone preservative-free eye drops for at least six weeks. I treated his myeloma gland dysfunction, doxycycline in addition to sodium hyaluronate, uh, treated his blepharitis because it was very bad blepharitis to reduce the risk of infection and endophthalmitis. So I gave him antibiotic, preservative free as well. And uh, then I operated on his eye. And uh, obviously, it's been almost a year now, still managing well. He may still manage well in the future or not, only time will tell. So, but in other words, I think that's something you need to think about. The, during the surgery, the, what you can do to reduce the, the problem is to obviously apply mitomycin, but you need to take care not to apply it on the cornea, so be as posterior as possible. You need to make your uh, uh, conjunctival suturing uh, kind of flat on the limbus, so you don't need any exposed sutures, and you have to make it as flat as possible to prevent any uh, delen. And you need, in the clinic, when I was doing his 5-FU injection, I was washing the eye, like, at least for two minutes to make sure he will not have any um, um, uh, systemic, or sorry, uh, toxic side effects. Uh, this is the last thing I just wanted to show you. This was, again, a um, um, poster which was published in the um, uh, Royal College um, of Ophthalmology uh, conference. Uh, this is a kind of novel study uh, where we try to use eye curves. So people use cytosporin in the past, but not the eye curves, the new eye drop. Uh, so these were a patient, uh, like case series, 12 patients, I think in total, 12 eyes, sorry. Patients were having some discomfort despite using the preservative-free eye drops and previous SLT. So rather than taking them to the theater, eye curves was a solution, and it improved the visual, visual acuity significantly um, from average six over 30 to six over nine. And they, most of them, apart from only one patient, they uh, 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 kept, we kept them on the drops. So in other words, if your patient is complaining from the drops, or if you think they have ocular surface disease and you are doing everything you can, including the preservative free, that could be an option because eye curves is safe and you can use it for years. And sometimes you can use it as a cycle. So you use it for one year and then stop and then carry on for another year. So that could be an option. Always think about it. If your patient can cope with it, that could be the best option and you will have much less ocular surface disease. So the take home message, ocular surface disease is very common. Uh, so don't miss uh, um, diagnose it. You need to listen to the patient and examine them. So it's not only about examination. So if you see signs of ocular surface disease, you need to treat or at least deal with. And even if your patient is not complaining, as we said before, sometimes it could be because they are very elderly or sometimes it could be because they have no feeling, no sensation because of BAK. If we always uh, give the proper treatment, the patient's adherence to the treatment will be better and you will achieve your target. 
And lastly, if you know exactly what to do before the surgery and how to optimize the ocular surface disease, you may change the, the, the fate of your uh, trabeculectomy from having complete failure to having very nice diffuse posterior blip. And that's what we all uh, aim for. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Nazim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Munir, for this nice presentation, well-structured one. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah, uh, Dr. Ali Sheikha is with us as a panelist. Uh, Dr. Ali, okay. if you would like to, to add. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Ali. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لا تاخذني انا ما صح لي غير اي كان اونلي سي اونلي فيو سلايد بيكوز اي ام ان ذا ايروبورت تراكتو سي ان شاء الله يا يا فيري نايس برزنتيشن اي هاد اونلي سين ذا لاست فيو سلايدز اونلي اباوت اي نيد تو منشن اباوت ذا اوكلا سيرفيس ديزيز اون ذيس لاست اكزامبل هاو يو كان ويت فور ذيس 6 ويك اون ويز ذيس هاي اي او بي 0.9 Unfortunately, here, if you, if you wait, this is, uh, you have a big problem with this high IOB to lose this, uh, the vision. Mostly of uh, this patient, I try always to give this only for a few days and uh, did directly for uh, non-penetrating uh, surgery. What's your opinion about that? I think the trouble is if you do non-penetrating surgery, which I completely agree on, the trouble if you have very, very inflamed eye, it will fail at the end. So nothing will work. Your options in these cases could be, I'm saying could be either to do mix, if you would like to reduce the pressure and then try to gain some time to, till we optimize the ocular surface disease. Or some people, they do cyclodiode uh, micropulse, which I don't think properly. I, I Personally, yeah. I don't think it's the case, especially in Afro-Caribbean, because it can cause a lot of inflammation. But in his case, in his particular case, actually, because I kept seeing him on almost daily basis initially. So when I increased the dose of the Diamox, his pressure was controlled reasonably okay. I think it was on the upper, like almost high teens level. So I accepted this for six weeks. In, without having this, actually, I agree with you, possibly could the, the mix could be an option, but I wouldn't really do a trabeculectomy in very inflamed eyes, especially young Afro-Caribbean because it will fail. And then you need to move to the next step, which could be the, the tube. And then, you know, he's his very no, young, I mean, so uh, after 10 years or so. Yeah, sure. Only this is Dr. Munir here about uh, the non-penetrating. If this is, you know, this is trabeculectomy in this uh, uh, group of the age, usually have, uh, most of the patients have a hypotony with the young patient. Uh, with the Afro-Caribbean, I didn't have experience, but the young patient here with us, Mostly when you did the surgery, you find hypotonic. This is the, uh, a young patient, and especially also if that's the patient, uh, myopic patient, after metomycin. For that, I prefer if we can do only the spin non-penetrating uh, surgery, will be avoid the inflammation and the surface because we depend on the non-penetrating. I try many cases now with the Isnobir uh, implant. This is from uh, Ispano company. I find that the pressure go always in the lower teens and with very good result. Only this is about this point. Uh, I agree with you. For, for inflammation, I, I prefer not to touch the eye. Now, usually, as a protocol, all the patients, if I can give two, three weeks of fluoromethylone, I always give for the patient yes. three, four times daily. This is, will be so much better. Yes. I usually I cannot I cannot stop I, I cannot stop any uh, medication because all the patients referred in the last last stage I cannot stop any medication. Also another issue here uh, all other patient here most of the patient when give uh, dose of diamox for uh, long time we have problem with the potassium. I don't know uh, this is you make follow up for that and your. Uh, with your patient or not, but this is here with us. Most of the older patient, there is we have problem with the potassium. When give uh, for more than five to one weeks, the older patient we found that the potassium go down on this sometimes make a uh, problem for us. For that, I try to avoid uh, diamox for long time. For the older patient, for the young patient, we didn't have uh, any uh, any problem. 
Yes, I agree, but you can still give uh, treatment for potassium. So I usually advise him to eat banana, drink coconut juice or pineapple juice, or even take some tablets if needed. But uh, I think it's mostly, as you said, with the Diamox, it depends on the dose and depends on the kidney function and the GFR. So a lot of patients, if they have ba normal, um, um, like, you know, baseline blood tests, especially even if they are elderly, if you are going to prescribe for six to eight weeks, in theory, especially the low dose, it shouldn't cause problem. However, I do always baseline a blood test and keep an eye on them. So I repeat it usually after six to eight weeks, just to make sure. Uh, but patients who start to have side effects, I have to stop it. I have no other option. But in these cases, again, you may go with, as you said, mix or other non-penetrating um, uh, procedures, but the success rate won't be as good as the, uh, the trabeculectomy, especially if you optimize the, uh, the ocular surface. The other option could be to do tube surgery. But again, tube surgery is a big surgery, major surgery compared with the trap. Yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Munir. Thank you thank for you. this uh, nice presentation. Thank you very much. Wish you all the best. Yeah, yeah, thank you, you Dr. Ali. So, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and, uh, uh, welcome, Dr. Mazen. Yeah. Have a safe trip to Syria. Uh, inshallah. See you there. See you there. Inshallah. Salam, yeah, inshallah. inshallah. Allah um, is Let's take some, some questions from the audience. I think. Uh, uh, does eye curves differ from restasis? What's eye curves? Uh, first time. I yes, yes, the concentration is different. So it's the same, cyclosporin, but uh, the cyclosporin in the eye curves is uh, concentration 0 0.1, actually. And uh, it's, the restasis is, I think, 0 0.05 or something like this. So it's the same, cyclosporin. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, when scarring stage of blip start? When does it start? The scarring Sorry? stage. The scarring uh, stage. The, yeah, the scarring yeah. stage usually start after the week six. So depending, mm -hmm. uh, it's again there is no um, cutoff, but usually the inflammatory process is up to two to four weeks. And then the granulation process, which can happen after that. And then early scarring can start after week six up to possibly, I would say, three or four months. And it can last after and then after years after that, because it will change the habit, change the shape of the of the blip. Like it can make it encapsulated. So sometimes it can last for years after the, the surgery itself. OK, great. I think these are the two questions here. Uh, which application, please? Shirin, maybe we were in the beginning talking about the Sinjab think, yeah. application, I think. The Sinjab. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, actually, Sinjab Academy has an application now available on uh, the uh, for the Android and for the Apple. So you can find it in the Google Play and uh, in the Apple Store. So just download it and you can find the um, let's say a lot of uh, interesting features in it, um, like uh, uh, discussion groups, uh, like uh, you can access uh, directly to the YouTube channel with, the, or, with all videos, uh, as well the events like the cornea series, like the glaucoma series. So everything uh, is there. Now, this is the, like the first version, and we are developing the second version, which will be concentrating on decision-making. Uh, decision-making in uh, topography, uh, whether this is normal or abnormal, and refractive surgery uh, decision-making, uh, is the patient fit for uh, laser-based or lens-based or none of them, and uh, which type or subtype is best for this patient? and as well the keratoconus management. So this will be inshallah in the second version. So hopefully uh, Sinjab Academy will be very helpful for you, all of you. Uh, sorry, Dr. Oh. Munir for, for this. Uh, yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, marketing. Sinjab Academy. <laughs> yeah, Sinjab Academy advertising. <laughs> Sponsored. <laughs> Sponsored. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, do you have experience with ologen in the case of this challenge? No, I don't. I don't do it. Um, 
And rarely, rarely we do it here. I think even uh, Keith Barton, he mentioned he's not very convinced about it. But I think Ike, Ike Ahmed, uh, he preferred to do it. But it, it's, I'm not sure. I have no experience really with that. Uh, sorry, Dr. Munir. Uh, Dr. Ike, make uh, this is uh, with the metomycin, make the metomycin with the uh, ologene. I had done uh, almost one, one, uh, 100 cases with the ologene. Uh, really is uh, not a big advantage. The yeah. encapsulated come al around the uh, the sponge for the ologene. Yes. Uh, ologene come as the, because reticulated so, uh, become, come as the sponge. The encapsulated come around this uh, sponge. The uh, one advantage only with the needling. You can know where is the border for your blade and can uh, go more safe, uh, safely. Under this sponge, this is one point. But on the other hand, if the sponge come with because come with a square a square edge, and this is the round shape or the square shape, the edge for the blade come as a square edge for the blade anteriorly, and that make an uh, erosion or make this is said dry eye or dilling uh, beside that. For this is the disadvantage. Uh, depend on that, I make advice for the company if they can make the ologene as dome shape without this square, a square edge to avoid this problem. But this is uh, continuing with the same, uh, the same. And I have uh, two cases with the erosion on the uh, protrude for the ologene at this point when it's rubbing the eyelid with the ologene. For that, as uh, the last uh, few years, I didn't uh, use more. And I didn't find any uh, more successful rate with ologene and compared to trabecloctin with metomycin alone. I try also the ologene with the Ahmed Fal glaucoma implantation around the blade posteriorly to decrease the encapsulated blade. Actually, I didn't have any more advantage about that. Only the, uh, the one advantage if you need to make a uh, needling for the, around the blade, you have more safe. Otherwise, you didn't have more successful rate. Yeah, true. Very true. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you agree Thanks. to perform early surgery before using the third anti-glaucoma medication? Yeah, this is very interesting, really. I, I have my own theory, which I obviously developed after contacting many uh, senior colleagues. You have a combination, which is the COSOPT and latanoprost. So COSOP contains two agents, which is the timolol dorzolamide, and latanoprost contains latanoprost. So this combination, which I usually use as a maximum medical combination, it helps in, COSOP will stop the, the, the tap. So it will stop the production of the fluid. Latanoprost will increase the drainage. So if you are combining these two, I can't really see any big benefits of adding any extra agent. So if you are going to add alpha-GAN or timolol or, sorry, if you're going to add alpha-GAN or uh, iopidine or pilocarpine, all you are doing is just like possibly you are treating yourself rather than treating the patient. And you may get, okay, one or two degrees, but if you have progression, why faffing around really? I usually only use this as a third or sorry, fourth agent if the patient is very elderly and if I really, if they are not keen for surgery, so I'm desperate. But once I use this combination, COSOP, Latanoprost, and there is still progression, I don't really waste time. I go directly to the next step. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank I think you. Uh, no more questions and we came to the end. So I would like you. I would like to thank you very much, Dr. Munir, thank for you. this uh, nice um, uh, session, and of course, Dr. Ali for uh, uh, the uh, nice uh, discussion as well. Uh, thanks to uh, the audience for being with us, Definitely. and um, um, we hope to see you next month with the third session of the glaucoma series. Inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, session is available on the YouTube. You can go to the Sinjab Academy YouTube and you can watch it there uh, in the events uh, and in the glaucoma series as well there. Uh, have a nice evening for everybody and um, good night. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. 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 Th